Welcome to the Startup Grind. Okay, so we usually start out kind of talking about people's beginnings and, you know, being that you have this like 40 year track record in tech. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but he's 19. Um, gonna say. Yeah, this is being I get a round of applause or anything? Yeah, like he's 19. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk about, you mentioned a lot in interviews that you've done previously about your mom and her influence on you in uh, not only your decision to like potentially leave college, but also even naming Gumroad and, and yeah. just being a real supporter of you. Can you talk a little bit about how she's been an influence in all of that you're doing now? Totally, yeah. So my mom has been pretty awesome. It's weird. I never really considered her an influence. I think the best influence is like you don't realize they're influence. It's like inception. They like okay. guide you in the right ways. And if you realize they're guiding you, like you stop, you know, paying attention to them. Um, but yeah, she was she was great. Like she she probably knew I was gonna like leave college before I knew I was gonna do it. She was definitely paranoid about me working on apps. Like it was funny. I would always you know she would always tell me like get off your computer. This is all you're gonna do. Like, like, don't worry about it. Like, I'm gonna, only going to do this until college, and I'm going to get a real job. Um, so she encouraged you, but she sort of... Yeah, she encouraged me by not encouraging me. You know? it's, kind of, it's kind of like, don't do your math homework. You're like, no, I will. You know, I think. Um, yeah, I, I remember, like, specifically at college, like, when I told her, hey, I was scared she was telling her I was, I was thinking about leaving college, right? And, I, you know, I, so I called her, and I was like, hey, mom, like, I think this is going, like, it's going good. What's up? I'm like, you know, might move up to the San Francisco. And she's like, oh, cool. So at that point, did you have an offer from Pinterest before you left co college, or how did that like come about? I had offers from startups. I think I had one from Pinterest as well. But and how did you ultimately? How did you meet Ben? I met Ben um, out of the blue. Actually, he just cold emailed me one time. Uh, one of my apps that I had made, and designed, and built, and what have you, was on Hacker News or something, and he just saw it. And that I built all of it rather than kind of like a bit of a piece of it. And, you know, they were looking for an iPhone app at the time, which was a lot smaller than it is today. It's just like an email saying, like, hey, like, you look like a you know, go better, you look like you build the products that you care about, you want to know what we're up to. And then it turns out, like, two weekends from then, I was in, I was in a Berkeley, actually, for a USC football game. That was, like, the reason I was up in San Francisco. Okay. For the first time that I had, like, ever visited, um, I would just, you know, part of school, um, and I was like, hey, I'm going to be up you know, at Berkeley on Sunday, do you want to hang out? I was like, yeah, totally, so I met up with him Paul, and just, you know, I remember, like, leaving that meeting, I just really, I felt like I really needed to be in San Francisco. Okay. Like, I, you know, before USC, I was in Singapore, but even at USC, <laughs> no one really does startups, you know, no one really knows what VC means. I had no idea what VC meant until like, probably a year, and a, yeah, yeah, probably a year and a half ago. Um, but when I was up here, and I was like, all these people were throwing around these words that like I knew about. It was really strange, right. you know, because I would like, you know, see a point I would mention the word Twitter never. Right. And then like up here, it's like you're walking down the street and people are mentioning like every single buzzword you can think about, and it's just like kind of crazy. But I got hooked on that. I, I got hooked on the fact that these people were doing what they wanted to do. Like they were never really complaining about it. You know, it was huge, but Ben wasn't like, oh, I wish this was bigger. It's just like I'm really wanted about solving this problem. But so how of all the top. Um, this is the most awkward thing. Ever. It's great. <laughs> All right, so um, don't move around here. <laughs> I was liked about two things: the product. I thought they were, you know, the product was actually useful. There were a lot of people that you know were working on beautiful things yeah. that weren't really useful, um, and and it had a business model which I cared about at the time. Um, and and the other thing was that those two guys, Ben and Paul, the guys I met, actually cared about. Product. It wasn't like you know this weird. A lot of the time, you have these people that just solve a problem because there's a business opportunity. But I think they both really, really cared about the product. Yeah. And for me, it was like you know whatever like the monetary outcome is going to be. Um, I just wanted to <coughs> learn a lot and be part of a team that could help me do that. And, and that was my reason for leaving college. It wasn't to make you know a million dollars. It was to see if doing startups was a lot of fun and the career path that I thought would be you know the best for me. Right. 
and uh, that's why I didn't you know, stick around in school. I didn't want to spend four years at USC and then leave, join a startup, whatever, and figure out, like, wow, I don't even like startups. Yeah. That sucks. I just spent four years. Because you, you, you took a leave of absence. From, yeah. From college, I'm still as opposed on it. to, you're still yeah. on it. You go back. So, for, like, most people kind of wonder, I mean, this is a question that a lot of people have for you, is why did you leave Pinterest? Yeah. Because right? that, that, especially at the, at the time that you left. Yeah, it was definitely, it was just like picking up speed. I mean, it, the product was doing well um, before that, but it was picking up speed in the valley, and, and then people were starting to recognize my future shirt or whatever. Um, I mean, the biggest reason I left is because I wanted to figure out if starting a company was what I wanted to do. You know, that's like what was on my mind for a long time. It was like, okay, great, now I figured out that I like startups a lot. The next step is to figure out if I can do my own thing, right? Because that's even worse if I do that, expecting that I'm going to be a good CEO, good founder, good manager, whatever. Good at raising money, and then I go do it, and I kind of suck at it. And then I'm like, no, I don't really like, like doing that. Um, so but leaving, leaving when you did, do you ever look back and say, wow, I left a lot on the table? Yeah, sure, I left a lot on the table, but I also like gained a lot, you know? And like, I'm sure, I mean, I don't, monetarily, I don't know. I'm sure it still makes sense for me to love or whatever. But I've just learned so much from you know, so many people so kind of my answer, which is like so much fun learning all the time and like doing your own thing and doing all these things that you've never really done before. Yeah. Like you know what, yeah, I'm just obviously my engineer or whatever. Um, but I wasn't hiring people. Yeah. I wasn't like having to, you know, fire anyone. I wasn't raising money, I wasn't doing all these things. Like learning every still, day. Yeah, like you're just kind of you're forced to do it. You're like so like like who's running privacy policy? Oh shit, you are. Yeah. Um, which is fun. Like you got to learn all these pieces of the business. Like yeah. you, know, you never really think about all these things. You never really realize like how much shit like your CEO, you know, your boss, whatever, has to deal with. So you don't even know it exists. Yeah. There's a lot of that, and I think it's really important to learn that stuff, especially if you want to be kind of, kind of have to learn that stuff. Right. And you kind of have that's to learn been, it. That's been awesome. I think. It's very Let's talk a minute about. Um, one of your kind of mentors and advisors, yeah. Uh, Semel, yeah. yeah. Shop. How did you? Through Pinterest, actually. Um, okay. So he wanted to talk to me about potentially working at Pinterest back in April or May of 2011, so about a year ago, um, before the lunch with him. And I just liked him a lot. I just thought he was a really nice guy who was like genuinely interested in the band, and then hung out. And then I just kept in touch with him throughout that process. And with good people around me personally, yeah. in terms of advisors and whatnot, um, what uh, what do you feel like Simmel's really helped you um, the most with? Yeah, there's there's two things. <clears throat> one is one is his like technical ability for like marketing and press. Like you know, he's done that for a while. And most people that do that. So is that why you're in the news like every day? I'm sure <laughs> some percentage of it is. Good. Um, it's also helps that you can stick because only buzzwords whenever you talk about me. Um, but the other thing, which I think is a lot actually more helpful, is that I can talk to him whenever I want and basically vent to him. Yeah, there's, like really, yeah, there's like very few people that you can vent to. You know, everyone's in this in this place basically like living here because of an industry of you know, business incentive. Um, there's very few people that I actually don't trust with everything. And he's probably one of those. Yeah. That's really good to have. So kind of fast forward, and I know you've worked on other projects, but you know, let's really kind of dig into Gumroad, and, and totally. I know that you started Gumroad before you actually left Pinterest as a side project. It's an interesting, and, and, and you've also talked about the fact that it's something you feel like you could do for a very long time, and you're passionate about it, and I think that also kind of makes the difference, right, between yeah. you know people who make it and people who give up. Um, what about it is specifically like the thing? I know we just can't so figure it out. So weird. my head in it. It's my heartbeat. It's my heartbeat. Is it really? Holy <laughs> 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 Okay. All right. Now that we have, it didn't really sound like it was beating, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, getting back. Uh, Hold it real close. Hold it real close. Yeah. Yeah. This is like a This is like a video. It's a video. Um, <laughs> what couple questions I asking? I was asking about um, oh, the choice to, to go into payments and, and yeah. micropayments. Totally. How did, how did this become a, a like passion? 
Yeah, so, I mean, kind of in hindsight, it makes a lot more sense than it did going into it. I just really liked the fact that I could help people make money. Um, and, and like, I, I realized that I could make money from the get-go, and I would never have to, like, rely on some external force to, like, make my business, like an advertiser, for example. Right. I was always scared. Like, I build products. I don't like building companies. I build companies because it makes it easier to build products sometimes. Um, so Do I you want to tell everybody about Gumroad just in case anybody yeah, doesn't totally. know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, so, so Gumroad, really is, yeah, Gumroad is a, a tool that makes it as easy to sell as it is to share. I just kind of realized that there was this really big gap in how easy it was to share something with a bunch of people, you know, using Twitter, Facebook, SoundCloud, YouTube, Reddit, Pinterest, Tumblr, whatever, and selling something. Selling something is incredibly difficult. There's kind of two ways to do it. There's like the marketplace model where you like enter yourself in a marketplace, they end up taking a huge cut, 30 to 70 percent. And if you're a nobody, you never get seen. And then there's the personal website model. Which is like setting up your own store somewhere and like kind of like you to it from wherever you do content. And I kind of realized like none of these models really worked for this thing I had built that I wanted to sell. So I kind of built Gumroad being like, okay, like if you have all these people that follow you on all these graphs, social networks, whatever, you should be able to sell to them directly, just like you share to them directly. I feel like that's the most efficient way to sell something. Um, so I consider Gumroad kind of like the lemonade stand of the internet. Like before you kind of had to enter a version mega store to sell something or be part of, you know, the iTunes movement, Walmart, whatever. There was, no, there was no foot traffic on the internet before, right? There was no Twitter and Facebook when iTunes launched. There's no reason to have lemonade stands. But now that there is, I think there's a big need for that. There's a big need for anyone to be able to sell whatever they want to sell. They should know what, who's to say that you're a merchant. You're not a merchant yet. Someone else is. Um, so that's the problem we're trying to solve is just to totally democratize like the ability to sell something. So right now, who are the, the people that are mostly using Hub Road and how have you really worked? I mean, customer acquisition is something that people talk about. Yeah. all the time and totally. it's being you know a real challenge what is and, and this being something that's so new and like kind of a new concept yeah how are you going about it and and what's what's the reaction been yeah from from customers it's i mean so far it's been good we have users you know like there is just some amount of traction which is cool um but it's definitely tough like everyone goes into it and i went into it saying like you know some friend would be like how would you launch this thing and like, or how will you launch this thing? Are you going to get to 30 million transactions, which is the number we use? Um, and I was like, I don't know. I launch it, and then people use it and share it, and more people use it and share it, and boom, we've done it. And it turns out it's not that easy. <laughs> um, rarely is that easy. Otherwise, there would be, you know, cover would have already been created a while ago. Um, but so what are, what are you finding the feedback is, or the, the challenges, like yeah. when, when people are are uh, using it or then not using it? Like, what, what yeah. are the things that were the obstacles? Yeah, like right now, like I would say, like the, the tangible obstacles are things like we don't support direct bank deposit, or we don't support you know batching the files so you can't sell multiple things, or like our DRM is weak. And for me, it's just the best way to figure out what like why people aren't using it is to just ask them. Like yeah. a lot of the time, like you know, I have a ton of friends that like are just so bullish on their concept, they find it weird that sorry that no one like uses it. Um, but I always ask, like, you know, I'll talk to, you know, X Y Z person and say, like, hey, you should use Gumroad, and they'll either say yes, which is how do it, or they say no, and then I ask why, why not, and they'll say, you know, these three reasons, whatever they happen to be, and then I make a note of them, and then I go fix them, or I argue with them if I disagree, um, and then I go back to them and I'm like, oh, these three things that you said for the reason you aren't using Gumroad are now fixed. You should be using Gumroad. And like, they either say yes, which is awesome, or they say no. And I'm like, why not? And they say another three things. Thanks. And then I go fix those things. And I keep doing that. And after a while, they either get so annoyed with me they start using it, or Gumroad is now an awesome product for them. Right. Uh, and then they use it. Which is great. And so, from that, um, when you. Um, I just lost my question, of course. Um, <clears throat> when you are looking for you know, discovery of Gumroad. Yeah. Obviously, you know, there's the viral trigger of share and somebody, you know, buy something through someone that's that's there. Yeah. But, like, what else are you using to actually get people to discover it other than press? Yeah, I mean, right now, all of our focus is on the core product. Um, so I spend 99% of my time thinking about that rather than any hey. other kind of other distribution mechanism. One of the, you know, one of the ways we are thinking about it is, besides just really going hard and trying to get some a big person to use it to, you know, to reach a bunch of people, which is still using the product. Right. It, it's to get communities that might have access to 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 content creators and say, like, hey, like, you know, people use your platform you know, to curate and share and comment on each other's work. They should be able to sell it too. And you can use 
was in Gabriel right. Pearson, you're the EBI docs, like we love to hook you up and then that's our strategy, I guess, is because you get one of those, you get you know thirty thousand people. Uh, I'm a big fan of microsites, so a lot of the times like I'll you know for fun to launch my own you know, other projects I built, I would just build like a little tool that would kind of use a product I had built. Um, but because it's a little tool, it's a lot easier to kind of spread like crazy. So, you know, DuckDuckGo does these things with like don't track dot us, which is just like these long marketing pages about why Google tracks the crap out of you and why it's not always a good thing. And people might not share DuckDuckGo with their friends, but they might share this don't track us thing. And at the bottom, of course, it's like, well, if you don't want us to track you, use DuckDuckGo, right? right? That's like an amazing, you know, that's, I think, tripled their search volume in like 90 days or something like that. Um, so I think that's a great strategy. I think figuring out these like ways to get a lot of users. Yeah. I would I would figure out the people that need your product and go after them. A lot of people are like, this is awesome, like this makes these people's lives ten percent better. People aren't gonna switch if it's ten percent better. So who are those people for you right now? Like the people that are like, I need this. Yeah. Well they're the people that have content that they constantly create, and they have followings that constantly consume and they have no way to pair the two together. So there's like bands that have like two hundred thousand followers on Twitter or that there are people that are famous for releasing a song a day or a mixtape a month or something like that that are the, we built up this crazy following just on Twitter and we have no idea how to market it. We sell shirts right now. You know? So YouTubers are a huge market for us because like, there are these people that have these tremendous volumes and they love messing around with different re revenue streams. They use like, I think the average like 10 to 13 per you know, big YouTuber. Uh, so people like that who can constantly, constantly create content and constantly you know, share with their Followers now have a very strong connection with their presence and their, their social media. Let's back up and talk about funding. Yeah. Um, you've raised eight million this year. Yeah. Do, can you tell us a little bit about the process? Because you you raised your first million. Yeah. Right. And then years. and then you you kind of went and, and climbed and was the lead for this round. Right? Yeah. Totally. So can you tell us about the process of you know, like from your perspective, like how how you were either connected with them, and you know what your experience of going through yeah. pitching and getting through your next round, etc. Totally. And you were solo. <laughs> yeah, like I, was solo. Event, right? I was solo. I was solo until halfway through raising the Series A. Actually, okay. that was cool. Um, yeah, so this, the seed round it was me. It was a combination of things that helped out a lot. One of the things that really help that I think is totally underrated is I started raising money, I, you know, I joked like three years ago, when I started blogging about what I was doing and just being public about what I wanted to do and what I thought about. Because that's when it starts, is like the, the thing with raising money and investing especially is like, you get this one hour meeting with someone and then they write you a hundred thousand dollar check, right? Like that's typically how it goes. And it's, an hour is really hard to convince something. That's why people, investors, love relying on reference checks and intros, right? Because they don't know if you're awesome in an hour. They have no idea. You can totally be bullshitting for an hour and then go home and just like spend it all on, you know, I don't know, whatever you're spending money on. Um, a car. Um, but with me, I think well, I, you know, I had the references from Pinterest and, and other things like that. But I also had this like this blog and you know, Twitter account that people could go back like two years ago and be like, okay, this kid was still talking about these similar concepts or patterns or something. He's actually serious about building this, you know. Because I don't think it's actually that hard to become like investable. Because I, you know, at least talking to my investor friends that I have now, most investments they make, they know if they're not going to work in like a month or two, right? Because like they invest in like you know impulse or whatever, and then they disappear and they never see them again, right? That's typically you know if you're an investor that does you know, 15 investments a year, but that's typically the pattern. You, get. you find the, the five that you know exist six months later, then you help those out because they're still around. You know they're raising their shoes and whatever. Um, so there's that. The other thing is I had a bunch of friends. Like I, had, I spent every single weekend while I was at Pinterest doing two things: building stuff, which also helps a lot. If people know you're building, you can actually build shit. You're already at the top, 10%. Um, and meeting people, I would spend one minute because it's fun. It's super fun meeting people. Well, you're um, very approachable. Like even like you know when I tweeted you, I was like, let's have coffee. Folks, I'm like a short Indian kid. I feel like have to be approachable. Um, I like something like intimidating. Like, yeah. Um, totally. Like a lot of people aren't like that. I mean, I think it's a. It's not I mean, I, tr I try to be. I remember like when I moved to the to the Palo Alto the first time, January two thousand eleven. I was, I, I spent like the first day just emailing every single person I had ever heard of. I got like four responses back. Those meetings went That's really awesome. well. But now it's like whenever I tell people about people that I respect, they're the people that responded to my emails. You know, 
Yeah. So I, it's almost like, you know, sure, it's nice of me to do that, but it's also like totally motivated yeah. incentivized. Like, I think that if I reply to the I'll take two minutes. And then if I need something from you, maybe you turn out to be the next one. Yeah, you know, works out. Um, but yeah, I think it's fun. And I, you know, so with these meetings, I'm, you know, I met really cool people like John from Stripe back in March of 2011 or something. Um, I had this network of people. So then when I actually went out to raise money, like, you know, I remember like one time Max left shit and after I met up with him, he's like, hey, I need to do some reference check. Like, can you give me a list of people that you know? And I was like, dude, I've only been here and like been in the valley for like nine months, right? I've only been here for like yeah, eight, nine months. Call my mom. <laughs> yeah, you can call me. Here's my mom's phone. Um, but, and then I said dot dot dot, and I made, I literally listed like 12 names or something like that and emails of like people that he knew, not just random people. Right. Um, so that made it. And then he was like, and then it's it's also not just like I, I take the time to meet a lot of people, but the fact that I can do that means that when I need users, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Right. I can figure out ways to get to people. I can convince people, right? Yeah. It's kind of the self fulfilling thing. If you can convince invest investors, you know, people say that the game, raising money is like a game. You have to be social and do all these things and check all the boxes. Like, well, that's what you do as a company for yeah. users, right? You figure out all the check boxes they want to check to go check them. It's the same thing. So if, it's almost like if you can raise money, the chance of you succeeding is higher because you were able to check boxes. You were able to play a game. Um, yeah, those, that, those two helps me only put me to a bunch of people. Um, what else was the big deal? When when you got to when you got to, to raising the Series A, I mean yeah. you, you had gone out and, and obviously I'm just assuming they want to see team at that point. Are you you were under pressure to yeah put put a team together. Totally. So yeah. Talk about hiring a little bit and like that process. Cause that's yeah you know someone who did that for a really long time. I know it's uh, <laughs> it's tough. It's probably one of the hardest things. Um, yeah, so I was yeah I was one person until I started raising like the series A. I didn't really start raising it. Just investors to kind of ask what what was up, and I answered. Um, but I when I raised the seed round, I, I made sure that people were okay with me building this by myself. Like I was like, I think this is a cool idea, but make sure that like, this million isn't for hiring people immediately. Yeah. It's for me being able to not worry about raising money, so I can focus on the product and figure out if it's something I want to go. So they, they were that. really investing in yeah, you, and, and so. uh, if it wasn't going to be this, it's going to be something else. Yeah, because I built, you know, I built all these different products, and I can design and code and yeah. do all that stuff. So, you know, sure. so I, you know, they were like, okay, you're going to build something. Like your runway right now is like 30, 40 years, right? Um, <laughs> was something, something like that. And now it's probably the same. Um, but, but yeah, so I was one person until the series A, and then. When I talked to investors, I said the same thing. I was like, make sure that it was a little different. I would now I was like, I might hire a couple guys, but I still want to make sure that we get to a, a place where the product is really, you know, striking for before we Go grow like crazy. Yeah. So how'd you find the guys? How many how many people do you have now? We're still pretty small. We're like three full time, including you. Yeah. Okay. And so how did you did you know these guys previously? Were they friends? Did you work with them on projects? How did you ultimately decide they were the ones that you wanted to bring on board? Yeah, I mean, one one was a, a mutual friend, and one was a friend I had known for like ten plus years. So um, and then those, yeah. uh, um, but yeah, I just I just hung out with them, you know. Like I did this thing for the first couple hours, which was like I I was basically like, do you want to grab coffee? That's like my first thing. I hate the people that are like, do you want to grab, you know, go on the phone for five minutes or something? I'm like, no, I just want to meet you. Yeah. You know, because like, I, I totally think I, yeah. I can communicate better when I'm talking to you, actually. You know, I think I'm just going to have fun. Um, so I would always meet everyone in person at Psych Class, because that's my favorite coffee shop ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would, you know, for an hour. And my, my rule was actually if I, if, if an hour, if we hit an hour and we weren't like, if we were like winding down and started running out of things to talk about, not going to work. Right. Because we're going to have to spend multiple hours together. So, I would, so that's like keep going. Exactly. So if, it, if there was an hour and we were like still riffing on stuff, like then it's probably you know good indicator. Um, and then after that, I would be like, hey, you want to hack this Sunday for the whole day? And that does two things. One, it, it lets me observe how they're actually going to do, right? It's not me asking like, you know, a train's approaching another train at 60 miles an hour. You know, how long is it going to take to get that? Like that. It's really working on the product, right, for eight hours. And then I'm working with them for eight hours. That's you know, maybe a couple hours I wouldn't know, but in eight hours you probably have a pretty good sense of how good they are as an engineer and as a human being. Um, 
Um, and then the other thing it does is that they have to commit to a Sunday with me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it shows so you that they're, totally. that they're into it. Yeah. I mean, Did you filter out a lot of people in this process? Like, how many people do you think you talked to while you were... Like, for coffee? Yeah. Um, probably. That you considered, ser you considered seriously. Oh, uh, tens at least. Dozens, yeah, for sure. Um, it's great because it's a self-selecting process. Like, you know, I might be like, hey, like that coffee meeting was awesome, let's hang out this Sunday and hack for like five hours. And they're like, hey, I'm busy this Sunday, can you do Monday? I'm like, nope. Next Sunday? And they're like, nope. Next Monday? I'm like, nope. So it's Sunday. Sunday, they have to give it's us all, a oh, Sunday. Oh, it's always Sunday. Um, and it's great because the people that can't commit to the Sunday aren't going to be able to commit to the company yeah. anyways, right? right? So it's like, and it's me, you know, they, they self-select themselves. And that's fine. I'm not saying, like, I yeah. hate you. It's no, just, it's like, just no, you're it's not like, right for this. Totally. And it works great. I do the same thing now, which is, like, I love, I meet every single person that knows me. That's what me, I think, probably 99%. Um, but I always say, let's meet at, you know, at Psych Class on Saturday. You know, it's always Psych Class on Saturday. And that's a great filter. And I don't, I don't know what the percentage of people that take me up on it, but... To me, you know, to me, it's, it feels like 100% because I forget about all the other people. Um, <laughs> but it's great. It, it self-selects, and everyone's like, oh, my friends, like, how can you do that? Like, don't you meet with some weird people? And I'm like, actually, no. If you're in San Francisco and you're willing to be on a, on a Saturday in, like, a pretty popular startup hobby shop, Dang. you're probably not, like, a weirdo. You know? Yeah. You're probably, well, you're, at least you're in startups. You, you might be a weirdo, weirdo but. <laughs> but you're, you're serious enough that you're going to, yeah. you know, you're, you're here and, and now. So. so that works. That's not funny. Yours. Let's talk. Obviously, it's not all. I always say it's like not all kids and rainbows. What are the things that you have discovered that have just shocked you? Like, oh my God, there'd be parts of this journey for you. Like, whether it's product or. Yeah, I would say the hardest thing is being responsible for like every bit of the scariest thing. Is like, you know, I probably still do it while I like wake up at like. 6 a.m. and just like make sure I don't like check my email, make sure there's no bugs on the site. Yeah. Because you know, it's kind of different when you're like you either have these side projects that you know are going okay or you're working for your company. But like the minute it's your thing, mm -hmm. um, and something's broken, it's like well I'm spending like all of my life on this thing and it's not. If there's a bug, that's obvious. You know it's broken. Like that sucks. You know. So that's probably the scariest thing and the hardest thing is just like constantly not being happy with your own product. Okay. I don't think any founder ever is, but right. like. I didn't realize how strenuous that is on you as a person. Like, you know, you're joking that you never smile. I like, literally, yeah. I just like, don't smile. I'm just like, a little bit. I never um, see smile in the interview, so I wanted to smile on camera. But yeah, it's just because I'm like, there's so many things going through my head all the time that I yeah. just kind of like check out of most conversations. Um, and it's just like, there's just like no need to be emotional about anything, you know? Because like, the minute you're happy about something, and the roller coaster goes down, now you're sad. Right? Which is, I believe, at least subconsciously, you probably have other challenges, like I mean, look, you're 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 in a, in a payment platform. I oh, have to God. imagine that there are some things that yeah. you weren't uh, yeah. aware of. Maybe I mean, not that you weren't aware of, but like things that started being like, oh my God, I need to make sure of this, 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 and this. Like yeah, totally. When your site's down, when you're like a you know Twitter, it's okay for a little bit, but when you're handling money transfer, it's not it's not good. It's not good to be down. Um, one, you lose trust with your customers. Two, you feel like shit. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's scary. Like, I, I spent a lot of time making sure that the site is super, super reliable. Like, it should never go down. You know? um, and then the other thing is there's a lot of risk. You know, there's a lot of risk involved. Anytime someone can make money off of what you're building, yeah. people will try to make money off of what you're building. Right? Have, um, have you actually had situations oh, totally. that you've been yeah. like, oh my god. Yeah. Anything there's, interesting worth telling us? Yeah, I mean, fraud, I mean, it happens all the time. Every company that, you know, literally TaskRabbit, Airbnb, Uber, every single company that deals with payments and paying people, even though they might not look like a payments company, deals with fraud, a lot of fraud. Um, so we've seen it happen, it happens every day. Um, it's just making sure you're on top of it. One, you know, one situation that I woke up one time and I was like super psyched because this guy was making a lot of sales and it was our highest sales. Was, yes! <laughs> like, we're doing really well, this guy's making a lot of money. And I'm like, yeah, and I just, you know, go build a product, design a feature, and I come back to you, and I'm like, I should probably check out what this guy's selling, if he's selling so much stuff. And I'm like, oh, it's probably fun. Um, and I do a little more research, and I realize it is, and that, well, that was my first well, thing. You no, know, it was nothing. Oh, it was like the whole oh, thing. Okay. He, was, he wasn't really selling anything. Okay, he was selling, like, you know, like a TXT file or something for 
hundred bucks or something, or something yeah, something like that. And that was like my first thing, like, oh crap, people can actually use our shit for fraud already. You know, it's pretty early, and I already have to deal with this. Okay. But the thing with fraud is it's not kind of like an API thing. It's not like something you build a product and then you, you have like this whole team building this like fraud detection thing, and you just hit it, making sure it's sure. No, it's like built into like it's interweaved with your entire product. Um, so you constantly have to be thinking about it. You know, you can't just be like, oh, well, we're gonna probably we'll think about it in two months. It's like constant top of your head. And obviously, I don't want most of my engineers, designers, whoever, thinking about fraud all the time. That's not fun. That's stressful. So that's my goal. That's just my burden. And so, on top of that burden, now you have an enormous amount of uh, investor pressure, I imagine. And how are you handling that? It's not as bad as I thought it would be. That was my, my concern going into the Series A. It was like, okay, raising a million dollars for the seed round. You're probably betting on me. I can probably fuck up, but it's okay. Um, and I was actually like, you know, my mom was like, so when, when, do, you, when do you think you're gonna like, do all right in life? And I was like, probably when I get to like a Series A, because that's when, when people will- do all right in life? That's when people, that's my mom for you. That's mom. Um, and I was, I told her, like, probably Series A, because that's when people are gonna validate the business idea, and not me. Turns out that's not really the case. There's still, there's still a ton of risk at the Series A level, even more so than, you know, five years ago. Um, what is it like dealing oh, with, with that the, kind with of that, pressure? That money. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, yeah. The, I mean, the first time I experienced it was I just looked at my bank account that next day and there was a lot of money in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was like, oh, I should probably like, move this out of like, like my, you know, Bank of America account into a proper like First Republic bank. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did that. There's um, there. Um, we're on First Republic. Um, like yes. Really good. Um, but yeah, there actually hasn't been that much pressure. Like one was like I went into it with like just me at the time, and I was like I'm just building this thing, and like I don't really have to raise money. I raised like a million plus dollars, and I think I still had over a million of it left in the bank. So I was like, by the way, I don't have to raise money. I just wanted to talk because it's fun. Um, so that so there was that expectation was like, okay, this kid's still figuring stuff out. Yeah. Um, and and then there was. Did I take it? I mean, I, I took it mainly because of Mike, like the guy who's now, I guess, on my board is just really freaking awesome and he's super helpful, you know, it's his first investment. I probably, I meet with him up with him like once or twice a week physically and then I talk to him all the time, you know. And it's cool being someone else's like first priority, someone else who's already been successful okay. because if Gumber does really well, his yeah. VC career is also been, you know, it's just so tied to that. If Gumber, no. Um, but yeah, there hasn't been that much stress to be honest. Like I never really think about having that much money in the bank. I ever like bought anything right. with the money, like at two IKEA desks, I guess. But are, are they pressuring you to hire more people now, or are they? they They're still not like pressure. I would. The great thing I think about VC investing is they'll do what will make your company the most valuable. Um, and there's a little disincentive, like they want it to happen faster if you fail or not. Yeah. The way that works, but. But they've been good about it. Like Mike, I think one of the reasons I chose Mike is he started a company before. One's been successful. I think two have been successful. One failed. Um, he's been at big companies, small companies, seen ones do really well, seen things that were really going really well go bad. So he's seen that, you know, and that was my fear going in. He's like, I'm not going to take money because I don't have to, and then I'm going to have to deal with somebody who's like been like, why the hell aren't people using your product? I'm like, dude, it's not that easy. Like, yeah, it is. I'm like, I've done shit before, right? Um, so that was a big thing for me. It's like the money's great. Like the money's not why I'm doing it. I want the help. I want the experience. I want someone okay. who can be with another soundboard, like you know, someone else is. Um, and and that's what I think I got, which is why I did it. You know, I didn't I didn't go around and shop the deal. I didn't talk to 15 VCs, even though I could, I guess. Okay. I just I knew the guy that I wanted. I knew I knew I really liked Mike. I really I knew I really liked John from Gray from Greylock. I knew I really yep. liked Primer from Index. So I talked to those guys. I didn't really go around and talk to every single reason on the planet. The other thing is like, this was a thing I, I tried out, which I don't know if I recommend or not, but I never followed up on any PC email related to investing, um, ever. Um, and the reason I did that was I wanted to make sure that if, you know, if I were to raise this money, which I don't need to raise, right? I want to make sure that the VC I get on board is going to be really helpful, right? And their job as a VC is to make investments. So if they're not on the ball with making the investment, when the investment's closed and they have equity in their company regardless of how many hours they spend with you, they're probably gonna spend less time, right? So like, you know, a VC would be like, hey, let's meet up, like, 
next week, and I'm like, sure, give me some time. And like, they'll never respond. I'm like, that's fine. Okay. Because like, you know, yeah, it's not. I, yeah, yeah, sure, if I call it up, maybe I would have gotten a better price term sheet because they're shitty or PC or whatever. <laughs> but I don't really want to deal with that. So I never followed up, and that turned out really well. Like, my kid's been super helpful, you know. And and you know, there was other times you know, Danny, who were also like that. I didn't have to follow up. Right? They were constantly checking and making sure I was okay. Other still helpful. That's the other thing. Which I, actually, I came into it being really scared about, which was I raised the seed round, and all these VCs kind of knew I was probably going to be doing this for a while. So they wanted to help right before the before they invest because if they're helpful now, they're like, hey, but you know how helpful we're going to be when we do invest, blah blah blah, you know. But, um, and I was scared that if I were to raise a Series A from one VC, every other VC is not going to be helpful anymore, right? Because they're like, ah, oh, shit, he's not. I think we missed him. Whatever. Um, turns out they're actually all still really helpful. Yeah, so that was a concern that I thought was going to be a pretty, yeah. pretty good deal. It's like, okay, Mike's value add now has to be better than all the value I would have, you know, and I've lost. But actually, it turns out that everyone is still super, super helpful. Um, that's the great thing about the value is, like, to be honest, it doesn't really, I mean, it matters who you raise from, of course, you know. But you're going to you're gonna get probably the most help from people that aren't invested in your company whatsoever, you know. Yeah. Like other founders, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. friends, um, your parents, your, you know, your, your former boss, whatever. Speaking of the founders, person helped you the most recently. Yeah, recently. I mean, I Drew from Dropbox has been helpful. I talked to Kevin from Instagram, Adam from Cora. Um, you know, a ton of VCs have actually been helpful because they are connected to every other founder. Right. So a lot of the time, if I want to be a founder, I just talk to one of their VCs, right? So Danny That's awesome. from, from Index, you know, Mike from Google Board. Um, I mean, Ben from Pinterest, obviously. Yeah. Um, and, and you guys keep in touch. Totally, yeah. Um, the other guys from Pinterest too, not, not just the founders. Um, basically everyone. Like no one has no one has been like I don't want to help you, right? Like who doesn't? Um, it's like the valley. Everyone's like yeah. super super nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, Mr. Meal has been ridiculously helpful. Yeah. I mean, I just actually met this guy, Mike, Mike, Mark Grado from Boku. Uh huh. Um, Boku's like this mobile payments company, right? So he deals with customer problems with them too. He's like ridiculous. I bet it literally Monday. It's really good to meet people that are kind of in your same space. Right? Yeah, like totally. Learn That's a great that thing. I always, I always like start these conversations off like, so like, what do you want to know about it? Like, what did you fuck up so I don't have to? Right? He's always my like kind of go-to thing. <laughs> kind of funny, but it's true. Like, yeah. the best thing about founders versus Walker GGs is yeah. they fucked up right before you did, right? So yeah. if you can find it, it's almost like drafting in a race. If you find a founder that's literally six months ahead of you, they're, they're, they're you know, let's say, Metaphor I use to sign. Like, what, is, what is the thing when you jump over things? Like, I don't know, like, whatever, the, you know. Oh, hurdle? Like, hurdles, 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 yeah. So basically, I think of like the founder that I'm talking to is the person who's like hitting me on the hurdles, and they're knocking each one down because they're hitting them all. And you're like, they're getting now really, I have really to jump hurt. Yeah. And now I can just run because they were telling me, like, yeah. watch over the hurdle. Right. Terrible analogy, but I think a lot of people make the mistake of not actually talking to their like competition or people in their own space. Yeah, I talk to everyone. Yeah. I I try. I want to meet every single founder in the valley. Like, That's a good goal. Because I mean, now it's like if I need help with X Y Z, I have a contact who's done it before, right? And that's way more valuable than somebody who thinks he's done it before, or somebody who might know, somebody who might know, somebody who's done it before. Um, and it's not that hard to meet these people either. You know, a lot of these meetings, I just cold email these. People. As long as they, you yeah, know, they're right. and if they don't apply to the cold email, they can go get an intro for money. Right? That's what's not that. So I imagine people are gonna have questions for you, so I'm gonna like wrap up my totally. piece. Is there anything else you want to tell anybody? Like that, I give you the floor for a minute. Like, um, like a lesson or like a piece of advice for people that are going through. Yeah, there's there's one there's one thing that I learned recently that I think is really valuable that I'm still trying to figure out is like have the hard conversations as soon as possible. I don't okay. really like giving advice on like this. I'm like to do as well as it works. Silly. Um, but there's one thing that I have learned is like the minute you know something's not working or the minute you know that something like, you know, you might not like someone or someone's not a good fit or, you know, there's an, you know, maybe even an investor like you like you pretend to like a lot just because you feel like you have to. Just like don't bother with that. And then when you do care, people notice because they realize you're not bullshit or anything. Like you, when you're saying something, they actually believe you. Um, but yeah, I've lost a ton of respect, especially in the past, with like people that said something and then like 
someone else would be like, hey, like he doesn't actually like you. Like, well, the, you should have just wouldn't have said that before. Like, that's totally fine. Right. Um, but yeah, have fun is like the other thing is I'm having so much fun. Like, you know, a lot of people are like, so like, how's it going? Like, so I'm having fun, and they're like, no, how's number doing? I'm like, I don't, it's going well, I guess, but I'm having fun. That's way more important than the other one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah I, you know, the other test I have is like, is my mom happy with all the decisions I'm making? Right? Mom happy. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that your mom, like, if your mom is happy with what you're doing, you're probably doing the right things. Anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that's good. It's good to you. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Who's got questions? 